Hello, everyone. I'm Meredith, and welcome to the Brahma Kumaris Miami uh, Facebook series called Conversation with Friends. And if you've been watching over the last few months, every week we zero in on people that have been connected in some way to the Brahma Kumaris over the years and have been true friends of the Brahma Kumaris in some wonderful way. And Rosie Gordon Wallace is definitely one of them. If you're watching, though, you might if you're involved in the arts world in any way, then you most likely know Rosie for the work that she's done for, I mean, over 25 years. She's considered an arts advocate. She's considered a community leader, recognized for curating many, many exhibitions in South Florida. I mean, I don't even know what to say, except that she has been passionate about the arts and more particularly uh, or more focusing on the arts of the Caribbean and the African diaspora for over 25 years. So I'm very, very happy to, to get to interview an old friend. And I hope that you're okay with calling you an old friend. Absolutely. Because <laughs> you're not old, but you, you've been uh, Absolutely. It's wonderful It's affectionately friend. accepted. <laughs> For so many years. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, when I was doing an art show at WLRN Art Street, Rosie used to come every single week with wonderful art because she looked at my set and she said, it needs something. And I'm sure what she's looking at right now on the, where I'm sitting because I'm uh, staying up north at my daughter's um, home and I don't really have a set or any kind of area, she would want to decorate it completely with art. So I am very, very happy to get to interview Rosie. So take me back to when you did begin to see, and I'm not sure exactly myself how it started, when you began to see that there really was no, no uh, particular connection to the arts of the Caribbean and South Florida and, and other places too, right? And um, there were artists out there doing great work, but they didn't have any support. So is that what happened? You realized they needed it? So first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me, um, the Brahma Kamaris, um, as, an, as a movement, as a way of life. Um, I have admired and tried to adopt um, the principles in my own life. And uh, Meredith, you have been such a, an example of um, faithfulness and light to me as a friend. So absolutely, I am your friend. Um, and we've been friends for a long time and we will grow old <laughs> <laughs> together. Um, so your question was about how I started. And um, I am very careful not to say that there wasn't a focus on the Caribbean because so many of us live here. Um, the focus that I um, want to highlight today is a focus on contemporary artwork from Caribbean artists. And what happened in 1996, what I noticed was many of my girlfriend's children were coming back home to mm -hmm. Miami. They had gone off to go to schools in some of the most prestigious colleges, RISD, Chicago Art Institute, Pratt, you name them, CalArts. And they were returning to Miami without having a platform to land on. So they came back, they thought that the art world was open and accessible. They had their portfolios, they had their newly shining degrees, and it was very difficult to get anyone to pay them any real attention um, to their work. And so the complaints, every time I would see them in the art outside at a gallery or at an event, there was this complaint about not being able to show their work. And it really bothered me mm. because deep down, um, I too had those complaints in, ja in Jamaica about um, wanting to be an artist deeper than the complaint of showing it, wanting to be an artist myself and not being able to um, have a conversation with my parents. So that's the catalyst, the need for artists to um, who are educated, many of them had their masters, many of them had their BFAs. Um, there was no real space for them to show their work. And so that's why we started and it continues today, you know. So what I'm trying to understand, Rosie, is this, so was it because of the subject matter? I mean, here these artists, these young artists were 
obviously very, very talented. They were going, as you say, to some yeah. very, very prestigious schools. And so was it a style that they were, you know, involved with or was it the subject matter? Like what was it that defined them as uh, artists of the African diaspora or, or the Caribbean or was there something that was not yet recognized in this I world or in America? The, the, ans the answer is complicated because yeah. if you, if you, if the playing field is level mm -hmm. and you send your child to a prestigious school and I send my child to a prestigious school and they both return and one child or one young person mm -hmm. has access and the other, then there are other mitigating factors on the table. And I think mm -hmm. that race, um, as uncomfortable as it is to speak about it, even in 2021, um, there, these are black and brown artists that are coming back. There are also mm -hmm. black and brown immigrant artists. There are also black and brown artists who are from the Caribbean. And their language was as complicated and as varied as other artists coming back, you know? So it's not the language that was different. It was really the, the notion that these artists um, belong, that, that, they, that, that they could access this multi-billion dollar world. It, it, you know, mm -hmm. the art world is not a, a, an easily accessible world, even in 2021. So the answer, as I said, is was not not was but is complicated oh, mm -hmm. because um there there is a certain there is a certain kind of elitism that happens mm -hmm. in the art world and if you don't have contacts and i'm talking 1996 but i could be talking 2021 as well um if if those young artists didn't have real connections they didn't have agents they didn't have uncles and aunts who could pick up the phone and call on their behalf um there was really no access and so the 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 the, the, the real opportunity let me let me i'm talking to the brahma kamara so i want to yeah. be really positive <laughs> the real opportunity the real light is that we had to find to build a table for ourselves. That's really what happened. So um, the, the, the cliche that says, if the table exists and there's no chair for you, you pull up your own chair. Mm. That's what, that was my answer. Um, you're not able to show your work. Let's start showing the work to ourselves. And so that's when we started in 1996. There was no business plan. There was no real um, fund. Uh, my husband and I, did it because it was my passion. And, and so we started at the, at the Bakehouse Art Complex in Wynwood. In 1996, the Wynwood that we see in 2021 is a different Wynwood, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we were right on 32nd Street, right beside the, the cluster of hot houses um, where the children and the grandparents and the, the different um, diasporic communities of Puerto Rico, Santo Domingo, Honduras, um, Ecuador were all in that little neighborhood. That's when we started. And the artists, um, we started with a program called Final Fridays mm -hmm. that I instituted at the Bakehouse. And um, it was the last Friday of the month. And you, you came to some of them, Meredith. I've where been to some serve, of your wonderful art shows. Yeah, uh, where Rose we would serve, many years. serve a Caribbean meal and almost trick people into looking at contemporary work from the region. Um, after they had the Caribbean meal, there was poetry and music and then art. So, you know, it's been 25 years and... Um, Sometimes you have to be foolish to start, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have to be naive. I, I think that I could use that term naivety as to my attitude. I was not complaining. I was not pointing fingers. I was just saying that this cannot continue. But you were passionate. I mean, that's I, to me what I'm getting am. from you. I still am. I still am. You know, it's, it's, it's one person now leading a board of um, 10, 10 board members. We have a new executive director, Tana Dedunes, who has been hired July 1st with funding from the Andrew Mellon Foundation. So we've come a long way, you know, we've come a long way, but the need, as you would imagine, as more young people go off to college and more of mm -hmm. them return,
the need continues to um, to exist. So do I feel that it's time for me to go and sit in shady rest and just kind of say there is no problem no. anymore? That's not the case. Not you. Um, we've, we've come a long way going up and down, going up and down. Um, and the issues of securing a, a permanent space, which we should have, we don't have. Mm -hmm. The issue of having consistent funding for these artists so that they can have um, studio space and spaces to work, to build work to scale. The issues that we can adopt an artist for a year so that they can stop having two and three jobs. All of those issues are still the same. They're still the same. It's complicated. I mean, it's it really is complicated. Is complicated. I, I think people don't realize, you know, and I forget myself that to be an artist, no matter where you're from or who you're connected with, it's still a difficult journey because you just said it. You just said it. I mean, I don't think I realized that, you know, for a long time until I went to some complex in Fort Lauderdale where they mm -hmm. built they built apartments for artists with yeah, high art ceilings. Space. It's and called art cement. space. Yeah. yeah, and cement floors for artists to live in because, right. you know, you can't necessarily paint in any apartment or, or do ceramics or whatever it is yeah. that you do. You need space to... work, you need the materials, you need all of this. So I'm wondering, is it through funding usually that you're, it, because you're so connected now, you're so well known with museums, you're, uh, you're now you, very active with uh, the Perez Art Museum as a, as a leader there, a community yeah. leader there yeah. in the arts. As you said, the Mellon Foundation, people recognize your work and what you're doing. You're very generous. Yeah. And I think that um, I thank you the, the, the work is not singular. It started as a singular vision. It is now supported um, by our community. What I am saying is, and I'm grateful, mm -hmm. especially after a year like this, where many of our artists were furloughed, many of them lost their jobs. Um, there is a new mm -hmm. sense of gratitude and a new mm -hmm. sense of problems as well, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, but what I want to underscore is that you cannot do something with a singular focus for 25 years and not have some successes. So that's, mm. that's you know, that is, the, that is the light through which I am I'm sharing with you that we've had many successes, many in the lives of the artists, as well as in how we show the work. But what I'm also saying is when we started with five artists in 1996, and in 2021, there are now hundreds of artists, all of whom want to have their, their, their day in the sun. So, yeah. so one project, right? Focusing mm -hmm. on the region. Now remember, there are many art projects around doing stellar work. I mean, mm -hmm. Fountainhead, Oolite, um, Muse, um, Hampton Arts Lovers. There are many folks doing wonderful work. But what I'm also saying is I am Diaspora Vibe Cultural Arts Incubator. Our focus is on the global south. We are looking particularly to those archipelago of islands all the way over to Suriname, where these artists come as immigrants to our countries and we come as immigrants to our countries. And we, I think I have a responsibility since I've been here so long to at least give them a platform to land, a place to land so that they can navigate their way through the art world. It is still a very elitist, multi-billion dollar business. And when you have that kind of money, the doors are not easily open. If you turn the knob and you turn the knob, the doors are not easy. Now. Last thing mm -hmm. I want to say to you in, in terms of access is we don't have generational memory here. You know, we are first generation, second generation coming from these countries with a lot of talent. And the, the parents such as myself have spent millions of dollars sending our children to school. 
So do I think that they are worthy? Absolutely. Do I think that um, there would be, it would be lovely to have many, many more projects focusing on the region so that we would have more access points? Absolutely. But the return on the investment, both personal and monetary, those returns are small. And so as you know, as a businesswoman and an artist yourself, if you're not getting the kinds of return that you expect, folks are not going to focus on the region. And that's the issue. Immigration, region, access, billions of dollars. It's, it's that kind of puzzle. So it's complicated. But you just keep going is what you were saying. And, uh, and I do want to say, I'm not an artist in any way. I've been a, a, a lover of the arts and I've been fortunate in my life to get to work you know, with the arts through the, you know, through the media that I've been involved with. Uh, I'd like to uh, have been an artist. I think that was my little problem when yeah. I was younger, which was I, I, I had a family member, my mother, who was a really talented artist. And I used to feel, I want to be that artist. Yeah. But I knew I couldn't be because I didn't have any talent. But I did have a great love for the arts. And so I think probably most people fit into that, right? Into that uh, category right. where they might really like arts, but they're not artists. So I'm thinking of just... What is it that people in our community can do to, to advocate for the arts and to support the arts and support these, this great talent that we have here in South Florida? And uh, all, I, the I young so people that want to do the work that they do, they don't necessarily yeah. want to have to do some of the jobs. They yeah. want to they yeah. create. What does the community do? So Meredith, first of all, I disagree yeah. with you because you're an artist of words. You're a journalist. You have focused on through your, your practice in television all these years. So I disagree because the, the definition of art to me is a broad definition. It's not necessarily an object making profession. We mm -hmm. have artists in sound, we have artists in the theater, we have artists in voice. So that's my broad definition. But to answer your question about what can we do, we can do, all of us can do something. First of all, there's art. Art gives us the quality of life that I don't think any of us want to live without, right? Mm -hmm. So we can look at art, we can visit our institutions. We can choose to support one artist, mm -hmm. whether it's a person in your family, and by support, I mean budgetarily support them. Because when they come out of, when the artists return from their bachelors and their masters, that first year is really hard, really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. And many of them, if they didn't have to take odd jobs in order to support themselves, would give us a kind of maturity of work that we would benefit from if they just had, I want to say, two years of support. I'm going to mm -hmm. increase it from one mm -hmm. year to two years. So... A, a budgetary support, you have an artist in your family, budget, screw away some money, $500 a month, $200 a month, so that they can get, they can support their artwork. So that's a practical way. The other way is to support the, their efforts when they are doing their openings, when there's an exhibition opening, an individual opening, a gallery opening, because we learn about art by looking at art by embracing it, by attending the theater, by supporting our singers. I focus on the visual arts, but I am very aware that the definition of art is a broad one. But for the visual artists and the artists that do performance as an extension of their visual artwork, like a mm -hmm. Saint Val, who is now doing installations where you have an actual performance with it, and you know a Sears work, mm -hmm. we, we understand that it takes two things, well, actually more than two things. Artists need space to work. They need time to work. They need resources to work. And then they need community. Those four, if those four things mm -hmm. are in place, our the maturity and the level of work that we as a community would be um, afforded would be off the chain. As the young people say, it would be just off the chain. So yeah. Those are the things that we can do. So there are things that we can actually do. And I'm glad that you said that. And I'm going to keep that in my mind. You know, the next time I see an invitation for something to go to an arts opening 
or you know, in some way do something for an artist because it's really, really difficult to be an artist. I mean, whether, you know, wherever you come from, but it's even more, more difficult if you've come from another country like the Caribbean, somewhere or countries anywhere, in the actually. Caribbean, anywhere. Um, tell me a little bit about, I mean, like you say, you started with a few artists. Now you have so many. I mean, these are like your children, aren't they? I mean, I see you as the mother of the artists that you support. Well, a part of our mission um, of Dash yeah. Provide Cultural Arts Incubator is to promote and to nurture and to exhibit the work. So the nurturing for me is a big part of it. Many of, many of the artists from the region are here without their family members. So we do, we go beyond the call of duty in terms of support. I cook, we pick them up, we, we, we introduce them to people like yourselves who can assist them to move along. So it, this is really, this, what we use, we're using the word complicated to, to say that there are different facets, but the trajectories of the work, how it is that we have global impact how it is that we, we turn up in a multifaceted way um, is all of, it's all, these are all of the actions that it will take to, to support the artists. Everybody wants to have a solar museum show, Every, all of them, right? <laughs> <laughs> or, and so what will it take for you to get there? You have to have first a little, probably a group show, and probably a, a solo show in a, in, with an independent gallery. There, there, there is a pathway that artists have to, to, to navigate in order to get to the big, the big box. And um, I'm just saying it would be nice to have the playing field a little bit more level because talent is not the only thing that is being rewarded. You know, you have to have contacts. Mm -hmm. so, so Meredith, on your end, when you get an invitation from an artist, mm -hmm. if you're not able to go, share it with your friends. Mm -hmm. You know, we mm -hmm. have a platform, share the invitation, encourage your friends to attend so that we can expand the, 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 the circle of influence as well. well Thank, I'm appreciating all of this, uh, <laughs> these tips and advice on what it is that we out there can do. Yeah to help these, usually they're young artists, sometimes they're older when they discover their, you know, their talent or they realize they do have this, uh, you know, desire to pursue, to pursue the arts. And you mentioned Asser, and I'm wondering, I mean, you've had some artists that have really, really become recognized. Yeah. And maybe just tell me a little bit, bit about some of them. And did you know right at the beginning, did you know that they had this talent and that they were going to, if things continued, that they were really going to, I hate to use that word, make it, but they were going to, you know, get to some higher level of uh, recognition. So, so first, the other thing that I want to demystify yeah. is that talent is just one of the things that you need to be successful. Mm -hmm. Talent gets you from high school to college. That's <laughs> all it does, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you have a portfolio that other people think will, will stand the test of time. It is the rigor. It is the, the focus. It is the day-to-day -day practice of mm -hmm. going to your studio, going to your bathroom if that's your studio, going to your bedroom if that's your studio. It is the rigor of, of doing the work that allows you to mature so it's not just about oh somebody has you know people call me all the time I have a child and the child can draw and I said good send them to school you know <laughs> there's very little in, in especially if we're speaking about 2021 now there is very little that you can do with just talent alone the mm -hmm. talent has to be honed you have to have a language you have to have scholarship you have to have people that you're having these kinds of conversations with. There are curators around the world that you want to meet. So it is a very multi-faceted profession and not as simple as, as people think it is. And perhaps that's why it's so difficult. So when an artist such as Asir St. Val, who, when I met Asir, he was just um, finishing his, his uh, bachelor's, young, um, he has been practicing for over 20 something years. Mm -hmm. Stop and think about that. So, yeah. so the, the dentist, the doctor, the teacher, 
has a mature practice after 20 something years. Similarly, it happens with an artist. However, our community does not quantify that focus and that time with the same measure. They're not as rewarded as someone with a profession that we sanctify, you know, the usual mm -hmm. profession. And so it's the burden on them to do well is even more difficult. Typically, Caribbean families have a hard time getting their young people to dedicate 20 to 30 years to artwork. Mm -hmm. It's just difficult for them to, to, to embrace it and support it as a rule, right? As a rule. So that's another layer of difficulty as well. Families because they don't see it. They don't see no. it as a way and uh, these, the future, yeah, really. The, right. And they're bright. I mean, they're, they're accomplished. So a parent would much rather them go to law school or, or dentistry or be a, a physician <laughs> than become an artist. But mm. we have to talk, you know, we cannot speak today in this time of a pandemic, in this time of people talking about mental health, in this time of Black Lives Matter, we cannot ignore the fact that our spiritual being is important. And I am speaking on a Brahma Kumaris platform. I would be really deaf and dumb and blind <laughs> if I didn't say that our artists are, for me, a point of light, many of them. <clears throat> And that, for, and, and that many of them, through their, their um, wisdom, through their storytelling, they fill the gaps of the things. They are fortune tellers, and not fortune in the sense of me giving you a card, You're but right. many of them, through their, 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 their spiritual making, can tell. I remember, do you, I don't know if you recall, Danny Ramirez at the Bakehouse built two towers Mm -hmm. huge six foot something tower, towers mm -hmm. with balconies with people falling mm -hmm. out of the balconies. He had effigies coming out of the balconies. Mm -hmm. And when he built them, we installed them at the gallery. And this was the year before 9-11. Wow. He didn't, he couldn't tell us why he had built them. I mean, it, it was painstakingly done. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you follow artists, some of them that are intuitive can actually tell what is happening in the future. And I don't know how it happens, but it happens. And we, we have many examples. I'm giving you a local example of someone that we, that was so profound when it wow. happened. And I'll finish the story by saying, we, we locked these two towers up, Meredith, in the bakehouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And six months afterwards, trust me, when I tell you, we have images to show. We went in there and the termites at the tower, the wooden mm -hmm. towers down, yeah to a huge pile of termites on the ground. It was so symbolic. The, the, the destruction of the towers with a natural phenomena of termites that we in Miami know really, really clearly. Right. And also the renewal of the space in New York as a place mm -hmm. of um, inspiration, right? And future. Yeah. So I, I, I am, you know, I, I'm not trying, I'm trying to tell our audience that we have to treat our artists better. And America as a country has not had policy in place that would supply an artist with a two or three year step in. The Netherlands does and other European mm -hmm. countries mm -hmm. have, where if you have a contemporary artist, they can get a stipend from the government to produce a body of work so that they are not so um, burdened with day-to-day -day life. They want to own ho homes just like we do. They want mm -hmm. to have their families just like we do. And they deserve to have the support. So I think all that we're saying or you're saying in this conversation, this very interesting, fascinating conversation is, is that we need arts. We need artists in our lives yeah. to be able to think, to be able to reflect, to be able to just... Uh, you know, tune into something higher and something deeper, but the artists also need us. The artists really need us. Yeah. We need to support these artists. So I'm hoping anyone who's seen this program today and gotten to meet the wonderful Rosie Gordon Wallace, um, we'll think about that the next time, you know, and we'll, we'll think about the importance of the arts in our lives 
and uh, almost, you know, give thanks to these artists that are creating this art and think of any way that we can to do something. I don't, I, I don't have an answer, but uh, I have a feeling about this, you know, that sometimes then you think about something and then the next time uh, all of a sudden there's an opportunity and you say, They're yes. They're all around us. I they are that. all around us in our communities. And yeah. they're not difficult to find. And I think that an organization such as the BKs mm -hmm. can provide a place of solitude, a place mm -hmm. of spiritual renewing, a place of silence where mm -hmm. they can where they can um, have this have their resilience reinforced. So we can do it. We can do it in different ways. We can find solace for them. We can yeah. find love and comfort. And we can find support and, and it comes in different ways. So uh, I, I'm going to leave everybody with, with this, with some uh, things to reflect upon. And uh, I just, I've had great respect for all that you've done. And it isn't just Thank that you, you do the work, you do it with so much love and so much passion and desire to help and so much knowledge and know-how. I mean, that's important too. So Rosie, I thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I know we'll be seeing you again soon. I'm not going to let look go of you, Meredith. So I will <laughs> see you again soon. Thank you you're so much. You're wonderful. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. And thank you so much for joining us and, uh, and thinking about, you know, what we've been talking about today, reflecting upon it. And I know the Brahma Gumaras are just really uh, very, very much into reflection and thoughtfulness and just getting to a higher place in our lives of consciousness. Thank you. Thank you.